My name is Johan Dorel, and I work as a user researcher uh, at EA Dice. And I thought we'd begin with um, a raise of hands. Uh, so how many here have encountered issues um, when trying to figure out what research questions developers actually have for when you're doing a user test? Most of you, uh, or a majority at least. Uh, yeah, I think this is something that we all have encountered before. Um, and I think it's fun that you, some, or all of the speakers have mentioned communication uh, during their talks, because that's my, uh, what my talk is about as well. So I think communication is one of the most crucial parts uh, of any type of work uh, within game development. And there are tons of articles and talks about improving this uh, aspect for game development uh, alone. Uh, as game user researchers, we're usually um, in the midst of a lot of different uh, teams and stakeholders with different communication challenges on their own. And it's therefore even more important that our communication skills uh, and processes are thought through and, and great. So uh, it is important for us uh, individually, uh, but also on a team level, uh, that our communication channels are established, that they are clear, and that uh, we have a long-term goal uh, with our communication. If we don't, our work gets harder as we, we have less information about what we're researching. Um, problems are more likely to occur during research and tests, and our findings won't be as impactful as, as they could have been. Um, <clears throat> even a great study that's not communicated well won't have the impact that it could have uh, had you had better communication. <clears throat> So before I start, I just want to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. Um, I started my game CC research uh, at Paradox Interactive in Stockholm. Um, I worked with a lot of small to mid-sized uh, projects and games uh, who often had little experience working with uh, game CC research and our processes and our methods. Uh, and at Paradox, I worked with the the publishing part, so I worked with uh, the, mostly the external game development teams. And for the last year, I've been working at EA Dice, which is <laughs> actually on the same street, just across the road, uh, with Henrik and John, John Luke, wherever he is, there. Uh, but they're working there now, so I can wave to them. Um, and I've been specifically working with the Battlefield 1 team, uh, which is a much, much larger project, uh, and that has also spanned over a much longer period of time. Uh, <clears throat> so, as I've worked with all of these different teams and, and projects um, that have spanned all spectrums in terms of team sizes, budgets, genres, and platforms, I've found some common challenges that um, th throughout all of them, and regardless of these parameters, uh, and I've gotten, I think, better at resolving them uh, in different ways. Uh, admittedly, uh, with varied results. Many of the issues that I've faced in these projects and have to, had to resolve um, have ultimately come down to communication, and that's why I think it's so important. Uh, and I think that I've come to realize that uh, not only is uh, improved communication often the solution to many project difficulties, but it's also a very good preemptive process uh, in preventing issues to arise in the first place. Uh, and it's something that I've, uh, that I've come to find more and more important as I've improved as a user researcher. Uh, so to make this a bit more structured in favor of communication, uh, I'll walk through four different challenges that I've identified, or four of the most important uh, the ones. So the first one is how do you establish a good, good means of communication uh, with game teams that are already struggling um, or maybe already experience communication problems internally. Um, the second one, um, how do you get better at presenting findings in a clear and concise manner uh, so that they're immediately useful and applicable to the dev team? And thirdly, uh, even after having done all of this, it can still be difficult to get the dev team to take your research seriously and trust that it will improve their products. So how do you earn and maintain uh, developer trust, or developer buy-in and gain their trust? 
and understand the value of user research. And to, to wrap it all up, um, I want to talk about that it's important to realize that communication is never really a task that you're done with. <clears throat> uh, and you need to reiterate on it continuously. So, uh, communication within game teams, the first challenge. Um, so how do you as a researcher actually understand what's going on in the project and what is concerning developers uh, at the moment? Uh, usually it's done by email, you have Confluence pages or Wiki pages that are similar, uh, maybe you talk to your key stakeholder, uh, maybe you have game design documents that you, you can read. Um, <coughs> And we all know that game development is often hectic, and its iterative nature, um, and in its iterative nature, things change a lot. So it's it's also very interdisciplinary, uh, making communication between everyone harder. Uh, and different teams and stakeholders are not necessarily on the same page, uh, just within their own team. Uh, you could say in the in the game development body, the <laughs> the left hand doesn't always know what the right hand is doing. Uh, and this became apparent to me uh, quite recently when I was tasked to get a build for an upcoming user test we were doing. And I talked to the lead producer and asked, like, can we use this build? And he said, yeah, that's fine. I'm very confident with it. It's very stable. <laughs> and then a couple of minutes later, I went over to the QA lead for the, for the project and asked him the same question just to make sure. <laughs> And he said he was not at all confident with it. He was very concerned in using it in a user test because they had not been testing that specific branch at the moment. Uh, so the producer has, had really checked the, the Jira and the overall stability of the game, uh, while the QA lead was more focused on that specific branch and that they hadn't really tested it. And I mean, similar things happen all the time with uh, when you're talking to different stakeholders in the game project teams, when you're trying to figure out what your research is really supposed to be about and what questions you, su you should include. And when you're asking for the most important questions, you can get a various number of answers, all from UI and HUD to mission objectives to specific game mechanics like gunplay, um, maybe flying or the overall status of the game. Uh, very much depending on who you're talking to. <clears throat> so I think this is important uh, because if people are not aligned uh, with each other, you might receive the wrong uh, questions for your test um, or requests that might be invalid. Uh, for example, a certain my mechanic might not be in the build that you're testing yet or it's in the process of being um, redesigned. So even when your results come, they will still they will be null and void because they've changed the mechanic completely. Also, uh, if, if people are not aligned, uh, they might have different expectations on what we will be delivered from your, from, from your reports. Um, and if they, they all have different expectations, uh, some of them will be, be disappointed when your report comes in and they don't get, uh, get answers to their questions that they were expecting. So aligning on these things is very, very important. And miscommunication here uh, can be very costly uh, in terms of workload, both for, both for you as a researcher, which I all think we've done before, but also for, for the game team, since they have also to put in work to, to, uh, to engage with you and get your builds uh, and work in a way that suits the, the UXR or the user research tests. Uh, but it can also be, be costly in terms of personal relations when, when things go sour or things go a bit bad. Um, so some of the ways I've been trying to uh, come up with a solution to, to this is uh, before every test, uh, make sure to align with a few different people on the team that you're working with in order to get several different viewpoints uh, and opinions uh, when, for example, testing a level or a feature or what have you. Uh, this, iron out, this irons out a lot of question marks um, and it's a great way of being preemptive and identifying issues that can risk your session. Um, and instead of uh, pinging on Skype or sending emails and stuff like that, um, there is an easier way and that we strongly suggest, uh, and that is to be embedded within the team. Um, sitting next to the developers will let you pick up a host on, 
a host of things that never really gets communicated through official communication channels uh, because they're too small or uh, they just didn't have time for it and so on. Uh, and this is something I've learned when working uh, with Battlefield and uh, at the DICE. As I sit ri right next to the producers and QA, I've learned all kinds of different stuff that's in the build and small bugs that I would never have heard about before. And I also hear them immediately when they're found and are causing issues. So the time there is very, very small. <laughs> so what you want to do is uh, to become the equi equivalent of Varys from, from Game of Thrones, but on your team. So get your own whispers, uh, if you can call them that, and that will provide you with information uh, about the project, uh, feature status, the project's health, uh, any concerns and expectations there are from different stakeholders. And it will allow you to be proactive instead of reactive. And having more, of, more information will, will allow you to influence more, and, and you will be able to do so at the right time. And you can also, you know, tailor your reports thereafter. And by being various, I don't mean that you should be manipulative and try to take over the world or anything like that, but uh, you don't need to hide in the shadows, stuff like that. Uh, but more that having access to a lot of information is, is uh, yeah, it's, it's really good. Uh, and it makes your work much easier. So being embedded within the team myself, um, I've never had more easy access to everything that's going on in the project. And a lot of this has to do with just easy communication that's uh, allowed through me being embedded. So we can have quick face-to-face -face discussions uh, in the office when we meet each other in the halls, at the coffee machine. I can just go over to their desk uh, easily and so on. Uh, not everyone has this luxury, however. Oh. So, uh, so if you're not embedded, but you're close to the team, maybe you're sitting a few floors from them, go to them and ask uh, your developers and stakeholders uh, questions. Actually taking an interest in what they do and what their day-to-day -day work looks like uh, is a great way of learning more about your project and how it's actually doing and how it's created more in depth. Ask someone on the team a question about what they're working on. Um, you learn a lot of amazing things about how easy or hard uh, some things are to do uh, that are specific to maybe your game or your engine. Uh, for example, Frostbite is a very complex engine uh, with a focus, a lot of focus on environment and making everything look amazing and stellar. But there are some things that are that, that I would have thought would be, yeah, it's just can't you just do this with an interface or something? But it turns out that it's a huge task uh, because of however it's built. Um, that has been very helpful when also when coming up with uh, solutions uh, or suggested solutions. <coughs> and when doing this, you'll also, uh, like we've heard before, that it's important, you'll also develop more personal relations to the people on the team. And people are much more likely to help you and provide you with information if they actually like you. And if your team is remote, this becomes much, much harder, but you can always send emails ahead of time and also include several, um, uh, several people in the email chain so you get these different viewpoints. Uh, and also highlighting positive findings becomes much more important because you have less face-to-face -face interaction uh, and you, you, you have a higher chance of com coming across as someone just highlighting all the negative things with the game. So, uh, if you're doing user tests, um, sending a highlight reel video uh, is a great way of, of showing off what's actually working in the game. And maybe if players are enjoying uh, an experience or enjoying the whole experience or specific game mechanics. So I think that's a really good idea as well. Oh, that was that point. <laughs> um, So the, the next challenge, how to present issues and findings in a concise way. This could be an entire talk, going through very much in depth. I'm going to go into a couple of key points. 
<coughs> so if you have a good structure of communication already going, actually making good use of it is equally challenging. A lot of work within user research is about how to effectively communicate these findings, like we've heard about today um, as well. And rightly so, the, the quality of your communication dictates how, how much impact your, your findings will have. <coughs> I, I mean, you can, you can conduct the most rigorous study of whatever in the game, uh, but it will have no effect even so if your communication fails to deliver, deliver it to the developers. So, uh, unclear reports can easily be misinterpreted. They can easily, uh, and developers who have a certain bias to wanting to put in a specific change because they, they want to do it in that way and they're sure that it's the right way. Uh, they, also, they have a much uh, higher chance of misinterpreting your, your findings as well. Um, and the wrong actions might be taken because of your report. And this is something I've seen happen a lot, uh, or at, at least a few times at Paradox. Uh, especially when working with developers who had less, uh, uh, who had less experience working with games user research, because they quickly jumped on, uh, jumped onto our research findings and just went with all our solutions that we uh, suggested, without maybe taking a step back and considering what they could have actually, if they could have uh, made a better solution. Also, uh, long and tedious reports. Uh, Obviously, that's not good. Uh, they can be hard to read, uh, but the longer they are, they also the more time they take to read. So, costing the develop the whole development team that are trying to engage with your findings, costing them a lot of time. And of course, if it takes them a lot of time and it's hard to read, you risk actually losing them completely and without them actually engaging with your findings. Uh, and also, a com common uh, bad habit I've seen, uh, especially for new researchers uh, is to get into the habit of, of writing what I call implied issues. So imagine that you have a button in the game that's completely plain, so it doesn't look like a button at all, and players, players don't see it, so they don't engage with it. It's very easy to write, uh, button X does not, or should look le more like a button. And while that is probably true, and for this case should be implemented, it's not the actual issue. The actual issue is actually that the, the players aren't engaging with this button and they aren't perceiving it as something that they can interact with. And in this case, I mean, the button should be a button, obviously. <laughs> but in more contested areas of, of the game design, uh, this becomes more of an issue because developers might not necessarily agree with your uh, suggested solution. Uh, and it will be harder for them to understand what the actual issue is if you write it like that. Um, and also they might, uh, and, and yeah, while, while suggestions are really good, and I strongly advise that you include them, uh, the main thing of your findings sh and issues should point out uh, the actual issues. Uh, and let the experienced developers um, own the design. So some of the solutions uh, to this uh, that I worked on uh, is to just go to the developers and ask them how they would like to have the information presented to them uh, and how they are going to use it and what they're going to use it for. Some uh, prefer less jump to, <coughs> sorry, uh, some just prefer less, less text um, and some want, just want the overall findings, um, some want other things or want to focus on specific areas that they work on. Uh, and they don't really have time to engage with all of your report. Um, and they don't have time to try to find all the information they need. Uh, so splitting the report into topic areas is something I think everyone is, uh, is doing or they should be doing. And uh, on the projects that, that I've worked with, uh, this split has usually been on a mechanical level such as UI or HUD, um, combat mechanics, story understanding. But this really depends a lot on your project and what you're working on. <laughs> uh, and uh, it depends, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, and it also depends on who your most uh, engaged developers are. So the role of the people you're reporting to is of course a good, uh, uh, like a guiding point, but it doesn't really paint the full picture and lead designers and so on might 
might have specific areas they're working with, so they might not just want the high-level findings, but they might be working on their pet projects and so on. Um, and one thing we, we did for, uh, actually for City Skylines when I worked at Paradox, was to report the issues in the tool that developers were familiar with, um, that they already worked with for project planning and bug, bug reporting, uh, which is called Jira. Not sure if everyone is familiar with Jira, but it's a common software tool. And it's, you can use it for a host of things, but it's mostly used for bug reporting and, uh, and project planning. And by, by continuously reporting issues in, in Jira, um, the developers were already familiar with it, so they could engage much easier with our findings. And um, we were able to communicate with the developers very uh, easy. We could just send it to one of the developers, and they asked if they needed stuff clarif clarified or if they didn't agree that it was an issue or the, of the severity of it and whatnot, and we could have a discussion there. Uh, and this let us send high-level reports to, to, uh, to producers and other executive stakeholders about the severities and more high-level findings for the, for the project. And the last thing is something I actually learned from Jean-Luc, uh, is that I'd also suggest planning a buffer for questions about your report. So send out to the report, uh, have the presentation or brief meeting or whatever you, you do, uh, but also try to send, out, send it out to the whole team. And uh, plan spending a couple of hours or so on the questions that will arise from, uh, uh, from the developers about the report. Uh, they usually have stuff they want clarified, they, want, they don't agree with your issues because it's not an issue, or uh, what have you. Or they want further information or something relating to, the, to that. Um, and these questions don't always come. Um, so invest the time in doing other things as well. Um, don't just sit <laughs> and wait. But uh, when the questions do come and you have allocated time for it, uh, attack them sharply and decisively. Uh, and answer these questions that the developers have. Uh, this will make the developers feel seen, or your colleagues, uh, and a a actually answering them will show that whatever they want information on, you can help them, and you want to help them. Uh, and I mean, in our bus busy lives um, as researchers, if we don't plan a buffer for this, we usually don't really have time to dig in this, into this very much. That's why I think it's a really good way uh, by planning this buffer time. Uh, and this builds also builds trust, and you can find out how to help your developers in the best way possible. Cool. So, uh, developer buy-in and trust. Uh, this is, well, this challenge is one of the more, uh, it's more of a high-level one, um, and it's also one of the hardest challenges that I've faced when working with Games User Research. And it's also something I've heard about everyone struggle with, uh, how you get developers to buy into user research and for them to trust that the research is, uh, is correct and, are actually, and that it's actually a great tool for, for them to make better games. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the term research can in and of itself be or feel antithetical to uh, to the work that they do, and game development. Um, and I think it's not, <laughs> maybe research isn't associated with, it's more associated with slow progress and rigor, which aren't exactly always the adjectives that game development is known for, um, with rapid de deadlines and production ci cycles. So, <clears throat> if you don't have buy-in, uh, you want, or, uh, if you don't have buy-in, uh, or people don't completely trust you, they won't engage with you as much, uh, and they are less likely to ask these follow-up questions. And they will also uh, be less likely to, to ask for testing early on. I think we can all agree that uh, it's hard to ask for feedback on things that are early in development. And it's very similar to working with your own projects and your own reports, or this talk, for, for example, and it's much harder to send it for feedback early on when it's not looking at all good, uh, if you don't completely trust the person you're sending it to. Um, 
and developers are also less likely to trust your findings. And similarly, uh, they're less likely to read your report. And it's harder, I mean, it's harder to argue spending time on, on reading through meaty reports if they have less trust in the methodology and its source, uh, which is you <laughs> in this case. <clears throat> and you're also, um, yeah, without these personal relationships, you're also less likely to get these follow-up questions, um, and you're missing out on a great way to further uh, push your findings. So, when trying to come up with a solution to this, uh, I actually, I talked to my barber when I was shaving my beard uh, this week, um, and he found it very similar to to record things when running a barber or hairdresser. And he told me that about, they learned this in school, by the way, um, that about one in five or one in 10 uh, people have a good experience. They will also recruit or uh, send their positive feedback to their friends and also then recruit another potential customer for, for the hairdresser or barber. Uh, but also uh, if, if they have neg a negative experience and they're likely to recruit uh, two or three um, of their friends that won't go come to, to this barber. Um, so I think this is very similar to how Games User Research works as a service organization. Um, if you do good things, uh, time is actually your most valuable resource. Um, ah, yes, so I think buying and trust are not things that are gained overnight. It's important to remember that even if, if things go slowly, it's not necessarily that you're doing something wrong, but you've just not invested in a long enough time, or for a long enough time. So similarly to getting, trying to get rich, I, I think Warren Buffett has talked a lot about this. Um, you don't want to go for anything fancy or stuff like that, but actually compound interest and investing over time is what actually surely gets you rich. Um, and I mean, this can be very boring. I mean, this chart spans over 30 years. I don't suggest that you do work with one team for 30 years to get their trust, but uh, I think it shows how much you can gain from, from uh, long-term uh, investment in your developers. So when going into a project, um, what I would do is, is to find one or a few developers that are interested in your findings as much as possible and invest your time in specifically helping them uh, at DICE, uh, I worked with mostly with uh, the lead designer, the lead producer, and the creative director. Uh, and I've focused on answering the, their questions primarily. And doing this will have two effects. One thing being that they will become increasingly educated about uh, user research processes and methods. They will be easier to work with, and you can go more in depth with them. But also is that they will become your compound interest or your word of mouth uh, for your barbershop that you'll create long, uh, along the road. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this can take a lot of time, but it will give you a lo lot back over the long term. Uh, when projects are done, uh, new ones begin, and stakeholders start to go to different projects. Uh, so for example, um, during, during one of our team meetings recently, um, I think the creative director actually highlighted the, the user research findings and that the game was steadily improving. Uh, and the game was steadily improving and referring to overall user test scores and the R reports. Um, so I think that's a, that's a great example of how this happened over, over a very long time. Mm. Very good points. I should have clicked earlier. So the, the last uh, challenge that I've, I want to talk about today, there are many, many more in communication, is that communication in game development uh, and in user research, I mean, it's a hot discussion topic. I mean, we've heard everyone mention it here today. Uh, but how come it's so often discussed? It's probably not because nothing ever gets done about communication, uh, but rather that communication between different departments always can be improved. <coughs> So, I think communication uh, is important. Uh, it's one of the most mentioned parts of game development, uh, 
when trying to improve game development uh, as tens or hundreds of people or even more if you work at large corporations that have multiple studios from all over the world in different time zones trying to create a complex software of, with tools they're not really familiar with because they originated from one location and also making this, all of this entertaining at the same time. Uh, I read a um, Gamma Sutra article where they did a review of the two uh, of the, all the game project postmortems and from the last two years posted on, on Gamma Sutra. And the second largest subset of issues was about team communication. And in development teams, um, people often change. Uh, they change roles, they change to other teams, they quit. Um, and the same happens. This uh, happens for all teams, of course, like developers, publishers, user research, and whatever you have in your company. So they're always new in some aspect. So this, this means that how communication should work in these new teams needs to, needs to be re-established to actually be the communication you set out for in the beginning. Cool. So I think iteration is a commonly used word in game development. But it's not just for game development. It's also important for any type of process, and I'd argue uh, especially so for user research. Uh, something we, that we did at Paradox uh, for a long time was to always have a post-mortem after, uh, after each um, major test that we had done. So we did one with the researchers where we went more into the research side and we talked about methodology and what like of scales we like the most and how to ask survey questions and what have you. But we also try to have one with uh, actual developers and our stakeholders to find out how uh, or what they thought we could improve on. And we also found out like, what they wanted more of. And this turned out to be a great way of communi communicating and improving our communication uh, aspects for the whole report cycle. And I mean, it can be tricky in the beginning uh, because developers are uh, they're very busy and hard to, can be hard to get into meetings. Uh, and it's a bit unconventional to schedule a post-mortem after each test, which can become very frequent. Um, but I, I think we got pretty good at it uh, eventually. And we always managed to get a, at least a couple of takeaways uh, from each post-mortem. <clears throat> and I mean, they could vary from nitpicky or adjustments to the report because something was a bit, they wanted small changes to the, to the formatting or what, what have you, uh, but also like standardizing report templates and that it was bad for us to, <laughs> uh, to change report template to another because it made their work much worse or it required a lot of work for them to adjust to the new standardized way of reporting or processes. Uh, so going back to the, when I talked about using JIRA for CDS guidelines, uh, this was something that originated from these post-mortems and I think that was a, a, something great that come out, came out of them because it also uh, made the, the, work, uh, or the work burden for the producers a lot less because they didn't have to engage with all these small findings about this button doesn't look like a button or change the text of this thing because it's misspelled or Stuff like that. They could focus on the overall picture. Uh, so I would, uh, I would encourage all of you to not just do postmortems, but also to actively ask for, for feedback and more, and yeah, more specifically do the, the postmortems. Um, and this is also something that we've been implementing now at EA, but more focused on the research side. But I'm very interested in doing this and have been doing it a bit for, uh, or with the actual developers and stakeholders. <clears throat> so, just to sum up, uh, how to communicate within game teams uh, that are already struggling with communication uh, within, within themselves can be hard. Uh, so align with several different stakeholders and be the various on your team. Various is cool. Uh, <laughs> how to present findings in clear and uh, concise ways is, is a struggle, it's hard, it's a challenge. So try to ask your developers <laughs> ask your developers how they would like to receive your findings. 
uh, and structure your reports based on, uh, on the team's structure to make it more efficient. And if possible, try to report uh, using the same tools as your team is already using. Um, earning and maintaining with developer buying and trust takes a long time, so see it as a long-term investment. Uh, and your stakeholders should be your company's interest, uh, spreading the word of mouth about you. Uh, and lastly, uh, communication is never really done. Um, at least I think so. So uh, <laughs> teams are always changing. Um, so iterate over time, and doing post-mortems is a great way of doing this. Um, and yeah, these are only four. Oh, sorry, don't applaud yet. <laughs> so these are four of the most important uh, communication challenges I've faced so far in my career. Uh, there are tons of others. Uh, but by considering these and iterating on them in your day-to-day -day work, um, I hope you'll become better researchers and also provide more infi insightful findings and hopefully help you to make, uh, in the end, better games. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I'm also available after in breaks and during beers or mi dinners or what have you uh, for questions. Any questions now? We have a question there. Cool. <coughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Tom. Oops. <laughs> Tom from Xbox. Um, these are really great uh, advice and strategies. Seem like a kind of study per study basis or feature basis. Do you have any similar advice for trying to track such a big project over time? Like if you get questions around top issues or is it fun enough or is it ready for beta with such a big project? Um, could you repeat the question? Or well, in, how just do in you terms mean, of, like, um, it seems like you're doing a lot of communication around a specific study with developers on a feature. Yeah. But just wondering if you had any communication strategies for how to track it over time. So if you're two-thirds of the way through the project, is it fun? Is it usable? Uh, is it ready to ship? If you get those kind of questions for how do you keep the entire team, communicate with an entire team about the status of a project. Um, that's interesting because I've tried to do the... <clears throat> I've found out that I need to do the same thing within my team now. And it's been a, a challenge on how to present that. So the, the way we've done it now is to track some key metrics uh, and always show them to the team repeti uh, in a repeated manner and show them the, the progress uh, of, of certain key mechanics. And uh, for instance, we've tracked it on several, uh, both overall, the overall experience, but also on specific maybe levels or so, or game modes. And I think just showing them uh, every time the, the scores and starting with it very as early as you possibly can is a really good way of, of doing that. I mean, it won't really be progress or in the beginning because you'll only have this one study or two studies. Uh, but quite quickly, you, you'll get into the... when you have an actual progress to show. So I think it's starting with it as early as possible. Uh -huh. That's at least my takeaway for for future projects to, to find out what these key metrics are and try to track them as, as early as possible. Uh, because it also educates the developers what this actually means. And that's something that I see now that everyone uh, knows what the different uh, the metrics that we use are uh, and how to interpret them. Cool. Uh, how do you make sure it's to your communication's time efficient um, and stop kind of just communications for communication's sake and make sure that everything's actually still going ahead and not taking up too much time? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> so how, you, how you're time efficient in, in what do you mean, like overall or in specific reports? So, so uh, a lot of things you suggest, like uh, after a play test, doing a post-mortem and that kind of thing, um, it's gonna take a lot of, of developers off the floor Yep. Um, and put them in put them in a meeting room, or you know, potentially there's a lot of lot of money going into one room to have a discussion. How do you make sure that doesn't drag on or happen too often? How do you make sure those those meetings are important and useful? Um, 
Yeah, uh, I actually stopped doing postmortems for a while, just exactly because of that reason. So I think it's very hard to say if it's worth it or not. It very much depends on your process uh, or your project. Sorry. Um, so I think you have to have some. Uh, you'll have to try to figure that out yourself. And watching developers' faces when you're trying to ask five different people to come into a meeting is a really good way of, of telling how much they uh, want to be in that meeting. Um, but I think also what needs to happen is that you don't just collect all these takeaways and have a huge pile of takeaways that you don't have time yourself to, to deal with. So I think one of the key aspects is to do it quickly and get as many Takeaway so that you think you can change until the next project uh, and then uh, go from there. But I mean, projects go from being very slow in the beginning to being very hectic in the later stages at times. So I can't give you a definite answer. So have a gut feeling about the project. Uh, and you can see the schedules of the developers as well and see how many hours they have in meetings already to try to figure that out as well. Over here. Thank you. Um, from your experience, have you found um, communicating qualitative insights or quantitative insights more impactful when you're working within a project team? If I found quantitative or qualitative, yeah. More what helps to influence um, the kind of the design process or the development process in a kind of more effective way? Just from your experience. Uh, I think that that usually depends on the developer you're working with. Some really just like to see numbers, but don't really get why you should have numbers. So and it's good to show numbers, I guess. Uh, but it, yeah, I think it, it depends a lot on the developers. Um, I've, but yeah, the quantitative key metrics, showing them over time is a really good way of selling it in to, <coughs> uh, to people over time. And also getting, it's very easy to, or more easy to get uh, executive buy-in because they have seen similar charts from different departments and can easily understand what, what, uh, what they mean. And it's also very impactful when you can see that the game is progressing. Sweet. That's very clear. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's both are needed, I would say. Cool. Any more questions? Thanks.